and they got their heads together and they wanted to do something that had never been done before scientifically. And they were looking for a small creek that when the creek had excess water, it would have these naturally curling side channels to take this excess flow because what they wanted to do was to dam off sections of the creek, divert the channel out of the main channel, divert that water out, and then pump the water out of those sections of the creek to actually see what lived in the creek. So this is 1940s. So these guys hunted and fished their way through the Sierras, somehow found Seichen Creek, and in the winter of 1950-51, they skied out here with some California legislators and some representatives from the Forest Service, and that was when Seichen water quality has begun. We're also trying to make this forest more resilient uh, in an attempt to try to make it not fall apart even further as this climate continues to shift. Um, so that's a big deal. The second thing is, is our Keck Hydro Watch project. We're trying to understand water when it goes into the ground. Hydrologists will tell you they're fairly comfortable with water when it's in the atmosphere, but as soon as it goes into the ground, it's kind of this black box, this unknown thing. So we have 11 towers in here. We have 11 weather stations. We've got a bunch of deep groundwater wells. Uh, we've got sap flow. We have sensors on trees that measure when their sap flows. We've got shallow groundwater wells. So we're looking at lots of different aspects for water when, it, when it's here, both in the form of snow, um, in the form of water coming down the creek, and then in the ground. Um, so we're trying to figure out how does the veg how does the vegetation use it? How much of it evaporates back out in the atmosphere? How much of that snow or water that snow is comprised of actually makes it into the ground? Um, so that's the Keck Hydro Watch project. The third one is what I call our roadkill project, which the scientists prefer I call the road ecology project. But Highway 89, so when you guys got off I-80 today and got on 89, Highway 89 between Truckee and the town to the north of a Sierraville, in 1979, the Caltrans guys started a little database where every time they pull a dead animal off of this highway, they wrote down what that animal was and the mile marker to the tenth. Well, a bunch of us learned about that um, because a lot of deer get hit on this road. So we formed a group that we call the Highway 89 Stewardship Team. Well, that little spreadsheet that the Caltrans guys came up with is the best data set in the world for roadkill. So we got Caltrans to designate this piece of highway as an experimental highway. So it's the first and only experimental highway in the country. And we got a bunch of money a bunch of years ago to build the first annual undercrossing. Um, we took all this data and we made dots on the road. So the bigger the dot, the more animals get killed there. We put GPS radio collar on the deer and we can track them. And so the first, our first site that we chose to put the first animal undercrossing in, the theory was the more animals get killed there, maybe more of them are crossing there. So with the GPS radio collars, we're able to actually watch the deer pretty much use that place as a main point for crossing the road. So that worked. We just got a couple million bucks from Caltrans starting, the design starts next year. So just before, when you turned off to come in here, if you kept going a little further, you would crest the hill. So we're going to put fencing from the crest of the hill north about eight miles to where this first undercrossing is. We're going to put two more animal undercrossings in, and then we're going to put webcams along the highway so we can actually monitor animal activity as they approach. You know, the easy solution might be to restructure the, the vegetation along the road and make the places where the animals would go so they feel comfortable um, and help them choose to cross in a place where there's a longer line of sight for cars, and then maybe we could put some kind of active warning system for cars. People don't read signs anymore, you know. Um, so maybe if the light is flashing, you know, deer in road, maybe they might slow down a little bit. We, we don't know. So that's our roadkill project. The fourth project is um, Lahontan cutthroat trout. So the largest trout in the world is a Lahontan cutthroat trout. And those trout get to be 55 or 60 pounds. These fish can get just huge. It's the fish, the only trout that is in this, the Great Basin side. We're on the eastern side of the Sierra Crest. So this is Nevada's water, not California's water. So the fish that used to be here was the Lahontan. And when they started putting Brooks, Browns, and Rainbows in these creeks, they outcompete them. So the Lahontans are now a threatened and endangered species. The last population of Lahontans left is right across this ridge to the north of us, Independence Lake. And so we're, we're fully funded. Um, 
platform. Right now the engineers are designing the barrier, the fish barrier, which will be down by 89. It's an engineering problem, it's not a fish problem. The engineering problem is how can we build a barrier to keep other fish from coming up that can also survive big rain on snow events. And right now this creek is really high. Um, this creek is normally about one and a half cubic feet per second. Right now it's about 40 cubic feet per second. So this is a little teeny little creek. So how can you go, how can you design a barrier that works at one and a half CFS up to the biggest we've recorded here since, since 51 is 1,200 CFS, which is a big massive river out here. So it's a big engineering problem. So if we can solve that, then removing the non-natives and putting Lahontans back in will be relatively simple. Why Lahontans? Because they can live in really broad temperature ranges of water temperature, and also from slightly saline, salty water to alkaline water. So they can live in pretty much anything that this climate can throw at them. So we think that if a trout can make it over time, the Lahontan's probably one of the ones that stands the best chance. And it also happens to be the, the native species. And then our fifth project, which we just started launching, is a 50-year climate change project. And we're coupling it with a 50-year art project and a writers in residence program. And we're working on developing a K-12 program and then a public outreach program to coincide with this 50-year effort. So I mentioned earlier that I work for Berkeley. And, you know, in some worlds, Berkeley is an esteemed academic institution. And in other worlds, it's UC Berserkly. And whenever you go somewhere, you never know how you're being perceived. So we are doing a lot of interesting stuff here. And we think it's important for us to try to figure out ways to communicate that with a much broader audience. And we weren't comfortable doing it on our own because of the perception. So fortunately for us, we live in Truckee. And Truckee has a little, little watershed group called the Truckee River Watershed Council. And what's unique about them is they get people to agree on one thing, the health of the Truckee River system, and then bringing these people together to look at ways to actually improve the health, and particularly in the places that are that most uh, We have a researcher coming here from UC Santa Cruz. His name is Joe Sapp. And Joe works on slave-making ants. We have red ants here that don't do anything except attack other ant colonies. They can't rear their young. They can't feed themselves. They're totally dependent on enslaving other ants. So these ants live in the ground, you don't see them, they're bright red, and then every once in a while, one of them will come up out of the ground, go find another ant colony, and then it will leave a trail, and then thousands of red ants will come up out of the ground, <coughs> swarm, it's like a red carpet moving, attack another ant colony, they will haul all the pupa and larva from the other ant colony back to their nest, put them in the ground, the red ants go back underground, you don't see them again. And when the other ants hatch and their larvae get active, they pick up the pharaoh from the red ants and they do all the work. They rear their young, you name it. It's pretty amazing. And so Joe's doing his PhD on our red. We have probably some of the most slave makers, for some reason, of any place in the world is right here at Seichen. There's a nest right behind the library just off the road that's been active ever since we've been here. And it's amazing one day walking up the path, it just, it's like a carpet this wide of just red ants. And then they make a single file line dragging all the, the stuff back. So Joe gets here on the 15th. And then we may have some other ones and twosies um, coming through that are doing um, some projects with pollinators, bees, and wasps. Um, the rest of this is just kind of talk about life here. Um, so, the creek starts in the west and runs to the east. So if you're standing with the creek to your back, looking up that way, you're looking north. Um, so it's really easy to get reoriented here if you get lost. If you find the creek or find the road, um, if you go downhill, you're going you know, east. Um, if you're going uphill, you're going west. So if you kind of get lost, it's okay. You know, you just find the creek or the or the road, and it'd be just fine. Um, we're split into three areas. So that first area where the food is, is what we call the lower camp. It's the bulk of our facility and about half of our beds. This is what we call the upper camp. This is about the other half of our beds. 
And then if you double the distance again going west up the road, you'll come to where we have another cabin and some tent platforms. And that's where the art program, that's kind of their, their world. Um, this place was pretty much built in the 1950s. And it was built with mayonnaise money. So Fleischmann Mayonnaise, the Fleischmann Foundation, which is in Reno, pretty much paid to build Sage Hen. So Needham, the fish guy, was buddies with the Fleischmann folks. So most of this was built then. We've done some work since then, but the bulk of the place was built thanks to Mayonnaise money. It's kind of interesting. Um, we have two staff here. Um, we are the busiest reserve in California. We are right around 12,000 user days a year, which right now doesn't seem like a lot, but we're busy. Um, every year we've set our new record. This is the first year that we've been here. We've been here 10 years, but we're actually not setting a new record. We're kind of holding our own right at about 12,000 user days. Um, so this place is what I call in a continuous, steady state of decay. Uh, we don't have cleaning service. We don't have a lot of staff. It's just my wife and I. Um, I am what I call the brawn, and she's what I call the brains. So all of our web stuff, all of our videos, all that stuff is what Farland does. And then I kind of try to keep up with everything else that's going on. Um, everything here is open. We trust everybody. And if we have a problem, you know, it's really easy for me to just say, Adios. Um, it's really hard to lock stuff up here. We do live in a gated community. Okay, you came through our east gate, which is about two miles east of here, and then if you go about a mile that way, you'll go to our west gate. Um, we live in America, and Americans don't walk. You know, if they can't drive, they don't go there. So we are open to the public. They just can't drive in here in a vehicle. And so we actually see very few of the public come through here. Um, there is a Forest Service campground just outside of our west gate. It's a quiet little campground. We usually, it's usually the weekends when it's kind of busy, but, you know, again, very rarely do we see somebody that will walk that far to come into us. So we really don't worry about stuff. Um, everything we have, all of our cars are unlocked, the houses are unlocked, you know, so we just trust folks. And, you know, we've been here 10 years and it's been just fine. Um, some things I need to make you aware of. Um, in all the cabins should be one of these. This is the gospel according to Jeff and Farthen. Um, there's a lot of information in here. It's my job to make you aware of some of the things that can happen. It's your job to inform yourself so that you can make good decisions. Um, the, my biggest fear is forest fire. Okay, um, we are, that's, that's ready to burn, that side of us. This side of us is still way wet, so I'm not so worried about the big fire blowing through here and consuming us. But I am worried about some idiot doing something stupid at the campground. And it can come right down this slope to get to us. Um, so if you wake up in the middle of the night and this place is full of smoke, and it like burns your sinuses, it burns your throat, that's bad. So our signal here that we need to get everybody together is honking car horns. So if you hear car horns honking, get up, get dressed, go find out where the horns are, and we'll tell you what we know. We have an incredible working relationship with the Forest Service. They worry about us. If there's something going on that they're aware of that would affect us within 48 hours, they'll get in touch with us. We have radios, we can talk to the fire guy, I mean, we can talk to everybody. Um, but it doesn't mean that something can't happen out there that they don't know about, that affects us long before they get the word. So if we did have to evacuate, we have two ways out. We have the short way, the way we drove in. That may not be our choice. We have another way where if we go that way, we go out through the gate, we meet at the campground, and then we would carpool around to make sure that everybody made it and got out of here. Um, and then our third choice is to what they call sheltering in place, basically staying here. So if you walk downstream from here and went through the lower camp, walk through the camp, you'll come out into a big meadow with a big, huge, 100-foot tall tower in it, go past it, go across, go south, go across the creek, go through the trees, and you're going to be in the middle of a big, open, dry meadow. 
that's where we would go if they suggested that we shelter in place. If we shelter in place, they suggest long pants, long sleeve shirt, something for your head, something to hold over your mouth and face. They recommend don't get it wet. You have this wet and you get flashed over, it can turn to steam, you inhale it, it burns. It's really hard to recover from that. Um, am I worried about it? Absolutely. Um, and as a result, we have a really strict open flame policy here. So does anybody here smoke? Good. Because if you did, I'd show you how to go to town and get a patch. So we don't allow open flame. Um, the only open flame we allowed is in the kitchen. So that big commercial stove, we have the pilot lights turn off the top burner, so you have to use a clicker to ignite it. Um, and then we have the pilot lights lit for the oven, so the ovens should, should heat up on their own. And then if you're going to be doing any grilling, there's two charcoal grills right there on the concrete. That, and that's the only place we allow open flame. Um, <coughs> the scary things. Hantavirus, which you get from high concentrations of mouse poop. Um, it's usually the dried urine dust that you inhale. It has to be a lot. It starts out like the flu. Lyme disease you get from ticks, little deer ticks. We don't have ticks at Seichen, but there's ticks in dry meadows, other places you guys may go. Um, Lyme disease starts out like the flu. It goes after your central nervous system. So if you guys are in dry meadows, you should start looking for ticks. Um, the bubonic plague, the black plague, it's here. It's in the little furry critters that run around. The vector, the way it goes from them to us, is through fleas. We don't have fleas here. And if you guys are handling small mammals, we'd have a different conversation. It starts out like the flu. <laughs> West Nile virus. About eight miles from here is the Sierra Crest. West Nile virus is to the west side of the crest. It's not on this side yet. The mosquitoes that vector it to us, we don't have that breed of mosquitoes here. It starts out like the flu. So you may have noticed a theme called the flu. Well, if you leave here and you get the flu, or you get something that seems like it's the flu, go to the doctor. Go say, hey, I was someplace where there was a slim chance that I may have been exposed to one of these things. Every one of these things caught early is manageable. But if you get the flu and you wait the week and a half or the two weeks for it to work through your system, if at the end of that two weeks you still got the flu, you may have just learned the hard way that you ain't got the flu. You got something that's now in your system and it's really hard to get this stuff out of it. I live here, okay? I'm aware of this stuff. Am I afraid of it? No. Because the chances of me getting it is slim or none. But when I get the flu, I go to the doctor and they say, yep, Jeff, you got the flu. Um, so I just play it safe. Um, injuries can happen here. So down there past the decks, you go in, there's like a little open area where you guys put your name on the board. Mm -hmm. Okay, to the, across from that board is a dirty desk, and on that desk is a phone, and that phone will dial 911. It'll also dial local calls, and it'll also dial long-distance calls if you get a, a credit card. Um, on the bulletin board behind it is a directions for how to get here. In 2002, I went for a mountain bike ride. I went by myself. I didn't tell anybody where I was going. I fell off my bike. I broke my leg. My foot came off. Um, and fortunately, it was on a dirt road paralleling 89. So I splinted it and started dragging myself towards the highway screaming. And finally, somebody heard me, came to where I was, I told them where to go, where their cell phone would work. They called it in. They sent the wrong ambulance to the wrong place. So, I put the directions up there because if you do need to dial 911, read them the directions and have them read the directions back. They're going to tell you, oh yeah, we know where you are. Well, just say, let me just double check. Because that extra minute or so on the phone, in my case, was two hours of delay. So, um, I sacrificed myself, even though I didn't know it at the time, <laughs> to learn isn't a, a, a lesson. We haven't had a dial 911 yet, but it could happen. So if somebody did get hurt, um, you go through into the library, which has got a bunch of computers, which is the little glass, little door with three glass panels at the end of that open area. 
you go in there, on the left-hand side is a bunch of first, first aid kits and stuff. It's there. If you need it, use it. Um, we live in that first building on the right, so the house, um, just up the hill, the first thing. When you guys pulled into the parking lot, is where we are. We're here for a reason. I used to be a paramedic. My father was an EMT. If something's going on, please get us involved. We may not be able to make it better. We might. We might not. But we probably got the logistics fairly well dialed. So please get us engaged. Uh, me, I'm a what I call an old guy. Okay, old guys go to bed early. <laughs> old guys get up early. My clock is different than most people's clocks. It seems to be working the wrong way. I go to bed earlier and earlier and earlier every year, and I get up earlier and earlier and earlier. So I'm usually in bed by 8, 8.30. If I'm a party animal, it's like 9, 9.15. So if you think it's important enough to wake me up, do it, okay? Go to the house, bang on the door. Bang on the door and be patient. Give me a few minutes to hear it. Get up, get dressed. You know, come and we'll figure it out. Um, so you guys know about the speed limit, the parking. Okay, food. You guys know about the food. The only place we allow food is in the kitchen. None in the cabins, none in the vehicles. Leave your vehicles unlocked. Um, in California, every year, they get about 300 orphaned bear cubs. Something happens to their mom. They evaluate these cubs to see if they're used to humans. Most of them are. Nobody wants these cubs anymore. And we've, bears are so smart that once they learn us, they don't forget. You just can't relocate them because they've already made the connection between humans and cheap calories. So those cubs get killed. Every once in a while, they get one that's not used to us, humans. And when they get one of those, they rear it in a, a separate wildlife care facility. And when the cub gets to be between 80 and 100 pounds, which is typically in January or early February, we have a plastic dog igloo camp here out in the middle of nowhere. And it's buried in snow. We'll go dig it out, put pine bows on the floor. They'll bring, they'll drug it. They'll put a radio tag in one ear and a number tag in another ear. They'll drug it, they'll bring it out, we'll load it onto the back of the snowcat, we'll drive it out to where the den site is, we'll stuff them into a little sled, we'll drag them over to the den, we'll stuff them in the den, we'll put pine dump bows over the door, we'll hang a motion sense camera outside, and we'll walk away. And when we do, we hope that when that cub wakes up and comes out, that it will grow up and continue to live as a wild bear. Um, we started this program in 2004. It's been an absolute success. We're averaging one to two cubs a year. Um, we see them. We can, we, as part of another project, our deer project, our Rook Hill project, when we're flying, looking, tracking those things, they're also tracking the radio in the ear of our cubs. So we did two cubs this year. Um, one of them has been living between the lower camp and the highway, and we don't know where the other one is. He's, he just is off. Um, so it would absolutely break my heart if we were to have to kill one of these guys because we were sloppy with our food. So that's, you know, a big reason for just being good. Um, we did have one day where that lower, the parking lot was full of cars, and I walk out of the house in the morning. Every door for every car was wide open in the parking lot. A bear had come in, didn't even scratch the paint. And it crawled through all the cars, did no damage, just left dust and dirt and fur as it was rummaging through. But because nobody had any food in their vehicles and nobody had locked the doors, it was easy for the animal to just figure out that there was nothing there and it moved on. So we did see um, a pretty good sized bear Friday night, a couple days ago, just right by the house. Um, he was on the road ripping apart a tree. We had some friends coming in. They took some photos. I didn't see it. You know, and then it got into the, what we call the fuel depot, another building with no door, and then walked away. Our cat saw him, freaked out, but, you know, we didn't see it. So there are wild bears, and they're, they're black bears. So they're afraid of us. So if you do see one, you're lucky, okay? And if you do, just enforce the fact that we're bad and they're good. So you just make, get big, make noise, and they'll run away. 
um, they won't come after you. Um, we have big kitty cats here, mountain lions, cougars. There's lots of them. They are well fed. Are we a problem to them? No. Well, we are. We're, an ex we're a huge expense of calories. They don't like investing calories unless they're going to get more calories in return. So they're not going to go after us. Um, in California, since 1848, there have been like 32 humans killed by a mountain lion. Every year, people get permits to kill over 100 cougars. It was more dangerous driving down our road than it is being worried about getting attacked by a mountain lion. We are where our deer have their babies. Okay, they move here in the summer, in the spring. They fawn in the southwestern part of our watershed. They'll rear their young. So the big kitties have tons of sushimi on the hoof running around. So we don't need to worry about them. Um, we don't have poison oak. You know, we don't have any poisonous plants. We don't have any poisonous snakes. We don't really have anything bad here. Um, and so in my world, the most dangerous thing here at Sage Hen is an orange cat. And his name is Buster. Okay? Buster is the most dangerous thing at Sage Hen. Take this seriously. Really? Take it seriously. You got me a little bit. You got me too. You got my Buster teeth. will come up to you. He'll rub against you. He'll want you to pet him. Maybe don't go the there. Maybe. Yeah. Sometimes you don't even have to walk up to him and he'll be... <laughs> um, we had him diagnosed. He's got a petting aversion. I guess his skin's hypersensitive. He wants to be petted, but when you do, it irritates his skin. It could also be some dominant stuff, but just don't trust Buster. You can still pet him, but just like be ready, guys. Be ready, because he will. He'll, he'll turn on you. Black cat. Boom. Now we have another cat, a black cat. Her name is Newt. She's named after the Egyptian goddess of the night. She's a sweetheart. She's a little more aloof. You know, she's a little standoffish, but if once she kind of gets comfortable, she'll come up to you and you can pet her and you can trust her. She is about as sweet as, as, you can, as a cat can get. So don't worry about her. 